The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Is this the year American democracy will self-destruct? Our political dynamic duo of Carla Marinucci and Bill Whalen are here to tell us how the view looks from the front row seat. The game is politics and the game is on. It will be the most expensive presidential campaign in history. And some are saying it might be the nastiest in modern history. Meanwhile, Jerry Brown wants to soak, soak the fat boys and spread it out thin, as they said in All the King's Men. We've got uh, Carla Marinucci here from the San Francisco Chronicle to talk about this year's politics, and Bill Whalen of the Hoover Institution. I'm Mark Simon. Thanks for joining us on the game. Carla, let's start with uh, the president. Let's start with um, the, actually, let's start with the bigger picture, the political environment. Is it, is, it, is it as everybody is nasty among the voters? I mean, there just seems to be an air of negativity that is layered over this, almost like a layer of smog over the L.A. Yeah, basin. Yeah, you said it may be the most negative in history. Let's just get it out there right now. When you've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, Romney Hood and uh, Obama Loney and uh, uh, the candidates <laughs> throwing things, it made up names and uh, it made up issues at each other, really. Uh, ads that are uh, in, on both accounts sort of baseless and just nothing but, I mean, this is beyond anything we've ever seen, I think. Is this the deconstruction of American politics? Well, I, I, let's go back into the history of our republic a little bit. If you go back into the early 19th century, I mean, you had yeah, just incredibly nasty campaigns. Andrew Jackson's wife actually dying of mental exhaustion from the attack against her husband. So I think we get a little you maybe... You could get worse. Well, that's, why, that's why I said modern history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah you, there's things that were said about Lincoln that I don't I, think... I think, we get a, I think we get a little too excited and say that, you know, the current campaign is the most negative campaign. You know, the news cycle gets more intense with each with each passing election. Technology pushes us forward. The coverage of the candidates becomes more relentless. And let's face it, the campaigning never stops in our country. Republicans were running the second Obama was inaugurated, just as Democrats were running the second the George Bush was reelected in 2004. So I think to the extent that people see it negatively, it's in part because I think the public is rather tired because it just hasn't been a break. Remember back in the days when candidates would take two or three weeks off and just disappear, which probably ended, I think, in 1988 when Dukakis did it. And seriously hurt his campaign. <laughs> now it's just constant stumping and it's constantly fighting to get in the news. That's where we get the, uh, you know, the, the shots against the two candidates. The only warning I would say is when when one side, and it's not the president's campaign, but it's people working on the, to get the president reelected, when you run an ad accusing somebody of essentially, you know, killing somebody's wife, you know, attributing their cancer, you've gone a little too far and that's when I think everybody needs to step back. Uh, you know, I think what we're seeing here is the, the real effects of social media this time around more than any other other time. It is driven by Twitter and Facebook. It is driven by the candidates' right. uh, fears of uh, YouTube viral moments. Uh, and I think the campaigns and all their operatives and surrogates now have a role that, can, that we've never really seen before up front. Yeah. Uh, any statement that they make now becomes the basis right. of a, a huge national... And, and I think the other feature is this is a, a tight election in two senses. Number one, the polls show these two candidates rather close together, but also you have a public that's largely made up its mind. It, you know, half the country is essentially going to vote for Barack Obama, and the other half has already decided it will not vote for Barack Obama. So there's a very small portion, five, four, three, even two percent, that are still sitting out there. And I think when you have that small and undecided electorate, I think that causes candidates to push too hard trying to trying to move them. I, I got to tell you, it, it strikes me as incredible that the, that that's true. That that the numbers are so so right. entrenched already. There's a tendency to think, for me to think anyway, and partly because of social media and the fluidity of almost day by day. There's something that's a big story one day, and the next minute we've moved on to something else. And some of them are substantive, some of them are trivial. It, it's hard to believe that people aren't. More flexible than aren't they aren't more movable than that. I, you know, I think that's the interesting thing about covering this race this time. Uh, you, you are seeing stories that are huge. Romney in London. Oh my gosh, that's the end of his campaign. This diplomatic gaffe, whatever. Uh, a week later, nobody. Two weeks later, nobody even remembers this. Now we're on to you know taxes. Did did Obama uh, you know uh, kill welfare reform? Yeah. Uh, it, it, did Romney kill off uh, you know the wife of this worker? I mean, we're <laughs> we're now into this kind of stuff. And the, and the fact is, 
We in the media, I think, are responsible for a lot of this uh, coverage. We're, we're jumping on these gaffes. It's, it's a gaffomatic campaign. It, we, we ping pong from one to another, and we're not giving people a lot of yeah. times the, the substantive from, from issue. I've <laughs> heard, heard a lot. I have a, I have a dog bed in my living room and with a big selection of toys for my dog to play with. And every morning my dog gets up and he picks out one toy to play with for that morning. And after a couple hours, he throws it back in the pile. <laughs> and on he goes, each day a new <laughs> toy. The most telling sight, I think, uh, for when something really causes damage to a candidate is when that candidate revisits the issue. For example, when Obama made the comment that was you know, largely to get on context about, about you didn't build that, yeah. somebody else did. And he went back and he actually did an ad himself explaining what he said. That's when you know you have a problem with the candidate. It's when they say something and then they have to go back and revisit it themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much of it is, is just the incredible amount of money that's pouring into these campaigns? The Citizens United decision that ruled corporations had the same rights as people. And as Bill Moyer said, I'll, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas well, executes one. There are two factors. Number one, I mentioned the, the cancer aid. That was done by a, a so-called super PAC so, working on, on for the Obama campaign's behalf. Uh, so the Obama campaign can deny knowing anything about it, just as you will find vicious ads coming from Romney super PACs. So that's a factor. But the second factor, besides the, the money put out there by Citizens United, is just the relentless pursuit of the candidates for money. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, trying to get and, money yeah. in two thousand and thirty-eight thousand dollar implements, where they are just constantly, especially coming here to the Bay Area, just constantly mining people for money when this, when they could be talking you're right, about better this things. This is the striking thing about the campaign. You're seeing whole days where Obama's doing six fundraisers in a single day. Right. This is not uncommon. Romney, the same. If it's not them, it's the surrogates. Uh, well, I've had donors, big donors here in California, tell me that you know, in the good old days they could say, "Hey, I'm tapped out. I, you know, I've already given." Now, but you know, they they get uh, hit by all these super PAC groups, and now there's California-specific super PAC groups right. on the congressional level, even for individual campaigns. So there's no excuse anymore for these donors not to give, no. and uh, there's no excuse for the campaigns and their surrogates to go out there right. pushing for and money. Both candidates have talked themselves in a sort of Cold War mentality when it comes to money. The Romney campaign's MO has been that we're not going to be the McCain campaign. Remember, John McCain went by uh, spending limits, and he got horribly outspent by Obama in the November election. It cost him a couple of states. So the Romney campaign is determined, ain't going to happen to us. We're going to raise more money than President Obama, which in turn drives fear into the heart of the Obama campaign. By God, they're going to outraise us. We're going to outrate them. And it's like watching the U.S. and the USSR each develop their missiles. And meanwhile, both the candidates are throwing themselves out there like, have dinner with Barack Obama. And this week, I can't have dinner with Mitt Romney. I mean, it's become the kind of stuff we've never seen before. And the problem is, I guess, is that none of that money goes toward a good cause, which is a clear <laughs> right. and in, in concise discussion of the issues. Yeah, really. It's all spent on hitting the hot button issues and hitting them in the most sort of outrageous way. And it gets back to your original idea that the election is too close to call. Right. All it seems to be doing between that and people's use of social media to go pursue information on their own terms mm -hmm. is that it seems that it just, you hear something about Romney, if you were for Romney, it reinforces what you thought, right. or if you're against him, it reinforces what you thought. It yeah. doesn't tell you anything new. It's a wonderful system if you're a political consultant and you get a cut of the action. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful system if you're a local TV station. Out, out, out yeah. If you're a local TV station yeah. in Florida or Ohio, Nevada, swing state, it's a wonderful deal because you get ads ad nauseum. Uh, it is a wonderful system, uh, not a wonderful system, I should say, if you're a voter because you're out there looking for information. This is why I think the three debates are hugely, hugely important in this election because for that very very small sliver of undecideds. This is the first and probably the only shot to get the two candidates without the filters, without the varnish, without the spin, having to answer issue-related questions. Except we know the campaigns have so much control over these debates, right. from the height of the podium to the length of the answers, that I'm not so sure we're going to see a whole lot of light shed on yeah. any of these issues there. Carla and Bill, or Bill and Carla, uh, we'll be right <laughs> back. We'll take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. I'm with uh, Carla Marinucci of the San Francisco Chronicle and Bill Whalen of the Hoover Institution. We can't stop ourselves from talking about politics. We did talk about it. The election's close. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible environment out there. There's, we're awash in money, none of which is coming our way. Um, <laughs> Where's the good news? But, but in, in, it doesn't, instead of the, it's the economy, stupid, isn't it really, it's the stupid economy? Isn't that really ultimately what's going to be the driving factor is if it doesn't get better, if it just sort of muddles along, gets just a, a you know, what's the scenario? Does it have to get significantly better? It's getting a little bit better, but it's not getting a lot better. 
Well, hey, first of all, you'd think it would be about the economy, but Romney's got ads out there this week about Obama's war on religion right. and um, Israel and other stuff, too. Uh, the, the fact is, um, yes, the economy remains. The numbers, I think, the, the job numbers are critical for Obama, yeah. and we'll see how, what it is in September. It's interesting. But it if hasn't you, been great. If you look at the swing states, the yeah. economy, in terms of unemployment at least, is better off than it was a year ago. If you look at the swing states, the economy in the last couple of months is ticking, unemployment's ticking up a little bit. So in part, it's voters asking, am I better off than I was one or two years ago in the past couple of months? The jobs reports are perfectly sideways. Unemployment remains about 8.2% mm -hmm. in terms of new jobs created, 80, 100,000. You're talking about a nation of 300 million people putting new jobs in the Rose Bowl with some seats to spare. It's not impressive. <laughs> what the Romney campaign would obviously hope is that there is a bump. Remember, there is a jobs report coming out the Friday before the election. The jobs report always comes out the first Friday of the month, so it's right before the Tuesday vote. They're hoping that there is a little spike to 8-3 or 8-4 to push it over. But this is what's fascinating about this election. Uh, 1944, Franklin Roosevelt's campaign famously said, don't change horses midstream. You know, keep me in mm -hmm. office to finish mm -hmm. the war. The Obama campaign will say the same, that essentially the economy is progressing. But when voters look at that sideways 8.2%, while, yes, it's better than it had been a year ago, do they feel it's progress? And that's and that's, that's just, the flip of the coin. I just see some, some GS-14 sitting there whose job it is to produce this report starts to get phone <laughs> calls about a week before it comes out. Yeah. About that report. No, well, you have to wonder about the, about the world economy, too. Greece, Spain, how are these are going to impact uh, the, these numbers or the, the general sort of sentiment well, that's, and conf that's consumer the great, confidence and everything else. Greece, the new California, by the way. Um, as Mitt Romney says, uh, that's well, the other thing. And he's beaches. wrong, by the way. But, but that's the other thing which you know, gets us in the whole issue of October surprises. For all we can talk about the predictability of the economy, what may play out, we don't know if something's going to happen, if Israel's going to attack Iran, if there's going to be a terrorist incident on our soils, just that, you know, that, that variable that could kick in at the end. But, but by the way, I mean, you're talking about the last uh, job report right before yeah. the election. People are starting to vote September 26th. I think it's, uh, is it Iowa? Sorry, right. Then in California, a, a month before the election, right. and, and many of the votes are cast yeah. in. But always, but always be before careful. Before even the first debate. But I always caution people to be aware about gaming on election in August. Remember, if we were having this conversation in August 2008, we would have talked about a campaign mostly driven by foreign policy, and then what happens in the beginning of September, financial meltdown. Yeah. yeah. So it... it does it always come back to the economy, ultimately, you think? Is it going to come back to that? I think it does because the economy is ultimately, a, you know, the referendum on the president's progress. Yeah. Yeah. But it also comes down to, um, uh, the, when you look at these campaigns and the themes they're going for, uh, the Republicans are going on Solyndra, the, the Democrats are going on Bain. Yeah. It should be about the economy. It's on these other issues. We, um, we have an Obama who was starkly uh, contrasted from who he was four years ago. Right. I still remember election night, you were gracious enough to call us during our election show. That's right. And I could tell from the tone of your voice you were seeing something that you really had never seen in yeah, politics in Chicago, before, just the yeah. sheer yeah. sort of emotion of the moment, the historic nature of the moment, that incredible sense of goodwill he had, uh, hope and change. Um, Obama then, Obama now. What's happened? You know, it's interesting because you see even Democrats here in California, a place where he's been so much fundraising, there is a sense of, uh, of sort of disappointment, I think, in uh, his, uh, they haven't reached out, this campaign has not reached out, I think, to a lot of Democrats, a lot of the Hillary Democrats, right. uh, a lot of the young Democrats. There is sort of a disconnect in a way. I think just as there is in, on the Romney side with some of the grassroots uh, Republicans and conservative Republicans. So in both in both cases, I think, uh, the campaigns are lacking. But on, on the Obama front, I mean, we're seeing it. Uh, I think in, in these elections are about a choice. When it comes down to it, a lot of these disaffected Democrats will probably, ca you know, get there. It, the question is, are the Democrats going to have enough passion to get to the polls, particularly the, the Latinos who I, are so important? That's the question, Bill, because one of the things he did by... by sort of the persona he assumed in the campaign was brought some people to the polls who right. who hadn't been there before, who hadn't been there in those numbers. Right, but you know, it's one thing to vote for a concept, another thing to vote for a reality. Uh, it's funny, I was in Kennebunkport, Maine last week, and there was a very funny t-shirt sitting outside a store, and it's a big picture of George Bush's face with a big goofy grin saying, how's hope and change working for you? <laughs> uh, but I, th I think, you know, if we want to, you know, quarterback the, the Obama presidency, I think that the problem I think he's run into is he was a candidate of hype in 2008. You know, ridiculous expectations, if you will. Then he takes office, and they really don't 
don't deflate the expectations. Mm -hmm. they, they allow it to continue. He doesn't kind of address the reality of his limitations. Uh, that, and plus, as Carlos said, a lot of nuts and bolts of being a president that he's been very bad at in terms of following up with donors, in terms of reaching out to bases, mm -hmm. just yeah. being yeah. like Bill Clinton, just sort of a relentless ward politician, which a president has to be. He hasn't. And while some writers love the Mr. Spock aloofness to him, uh, that could be very problematic when it comes election time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same question could be asked about Romney. Romney now and Romney then. Uh, it, it almost seems like he's two different people, and, and I don't know how much of that, and I want to start with you on this one, Bill, how much of that is simply driven by his desire to win the nomination and what he had to do to get there, because he is a substantially different uh, political figure and policy figure than he was when he was governor of Massachusetts. He's made about four different calculations in his political career. The one where he ran for Senate against Ted Kennedy, the second where he runs for governor of Massachusetts, the third in 2008 where he runs as a social conservative, because he already sees Rudy Giuliani and John McCain dominating the center of that field. And now this election, where he is the centrist economic candidate, which is the right place to be in a largely conservative field. Um, but with Romney, and this is something which bears to watch as we get toward the convention, he hasn't necessarily explained who he is mm -hmm. as a person, you know, the flesh and blood behind him. He he does have this, you know, sort of, you know, aloof business persona to him, but there is a person underneath it. And so now it's the time for him to explain the person is because you're not going to get elected in this day and age unless you can relate to people on an individual basis. Yeah. People have to find some common ground with you, likability. And you look at the polls and this is where he gets clobbered right now. It's empathy, it's likability. We're, we're going to come back to that in a second. Hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Bill Whalen and Carla Marinucci. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. We have Carla Marinucci of the San Francisco Chronicle and Bill Whalen of the Hoover Institution. We were talking about uh, which Mitt Romney, Romney then and Romney now. Carla, Bill is giving us an eloquent explanation of how he yeah, has to say know. who he is and what he's about. But, but the trouble is, who he is and what he's about was something substantially different when he was governor you know, of And I think we've seen this movie in California before. More than any other state, I think we've seen very rich people uh, with business backgrounds, whether you go to uh, Bill Simon, Al Checky, Dick Reardon, uh, Meg Whitman, uh, and we're seeing some parallels here with Whitman, very smart woman. When you got in a room with her, you know, one on one, very warm, and yet, and yet she could never sort of let that side of her personality show in her campaign. And I'm wondering with Romney. Uh, you don't see a, a connection with average voters yeah. there a lot. Right. And and I, look, there, if you go back 100 years to the four people who have kicked incumbents out of office um, pre in presidential elections, there are two common themes. One is usually a very strong personality from the challenger, be it a Reagan, a Roosevelt, a Bill Clinton. But the second is the idea of some sort of transformation, either with Roosevelt moving the country into the New Deal, with Reagan moving it in a conservative direction. And Romney at the moment um, has not necessarily offered either as a candidate. He's not going to have the personality, obviously, uh, that Roosevelt and Clinton and uh, and uh, the others did, but perhaps he now has to look at the transformative idea. It's either pushing his party in a different direction, which clearly he has stayed away from in this process, so he probably has to look for an idea. But, how, but how does he campaign for, as a Republican when when he was in Massachusetts, he, he was a liberal on some of the bedrock liberal issues of gay rights and abortion and some of those. How do you walk away from that stuff? Well, I think, I think you'll walk away from it. This gets back to the negative nature of the campaign. You'll walk away from it by trying to push voters in a different direction at all times. And you push them onto the president's uh, record, how the economy is doing, your personal comfort, the way things are in Washington. Just as if the Obama campaign, you don't want the economy pushed on you, so you push them into Mitt Romney's business record and inconsistencies in political But past. if you're going for a transformational idea, this is what we saw with Meg Whitman too. He's offering, like, what is it, 56-point plan. Uh, Whitman offered a 47-point. The voters, I don't think, have sort of uh, been able to digest this very complex, right. and, and what is his transformational is. plan to come up with those 12 million new jobs? But at the end of the day, this is what's interesting about this campaign. Um, 
common sense, conventional wisdom in history dictates that a president runs for re-election on his record, the idea of progress. Conventional wisdom, history dictates that a challenger pushes the country in a different dramatic direction. Neither candidate's doing that right now. The Romney campaign is hoping that voters turn against Obama at the end of the day, and that gets him into office. The Obama campaign is hoping that voters turn against Romney, and that sweeps him back into office. And that office. is the message for each campaign, don't hire the other guy. Well, and it's interesting, because you're right. Historically, when there's an incumbent, you start off by explaining to people why you don't want the incumbent, right. and then you explain to them why you're a better choice. Right. And, and they've never, neither one of them has really completed step one. Yeah, that's you know, right. Or, or step two. Um, let's switch a little bit to California real quickly. Um, Jerry Brown has staked a heck of a lot on his ballot measure. I think it's Prop 30. Right. Um, raised taxes on the wealthiest in the state, raised the sales tax. The state budget is actually balanced on the assumption this thing is going to pass. Right. Um, does it pass? Is it in trouble? Um, and how much trouble is Jerry Brown in if it, if it doesn't pass? Carla? I mean, I think the polls are showing he is in very deep trouble with this. The mood of the voters is not to uh, uh, pass taxes. Uh, at, at this point, and, and you've got issues like high-speed rail, you've got this uh, parks fund that's been found, right. millions and millions of dollars. Both of these stories make it harder for Jerry Brown to argue for this. And uh, what does it do to him? Uh, I think, what is his legacy if this doesn't pass? Uh, I think it's a serious blow to him. But Jerry Brown is a very wily character and is going to try and figure out something else, I'm sure. But he will. the fact is, I, I don't think this looks good for him at it all. It doesn't. Uh, remember, you have not just one but three competing tax measures on the ballot. So the governor's problems are compounded by the fact that if you do believe in additional revenue for the state, do you want to park it into government with the governor's initiative? Do you want to park it into schools with the Munger initiative? Do you want to park it into clean energy with the Steyer initiative? So that's problematic. But I think it simply comes down to this. A great day is when you put on a pair of pants and you find a $10 bill in your pants. Yes. Money found. Nothing better than that. A bad day for state government is when you find $54 million <laughs> under the couch. <laughs> and you can't account to it. It begs for all kinds of questions. What else money is sitting out? Yeah. So here's the governor trying to sell an initiative on give me $8 billion so we can make government work. And people think, wait a minute, this government has no idea what it's doing. But there's another message, which is... I'm not going to make everybody give me $8 billion. I'm mostly going to make rich people it give is. me $8 so billion. It's, and what is this? So it's, it's what, an, what it's an this interesting push and rich? pull. It's go after the rich in California because, let's face it, they're a convenient target. On the other hand, you're trying to bring in the government, and people don't like government in California right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I just think that uh, we haven't seen the governor out there really campaigning a well, lot But this, this is the other challenge to it. Arnold Schwarzenegger, we're going to have a long discussion about yeah. the various you know, yeah. failures and foibles of Arnold Schwarzenegger as a governor, but you cannot deny that the man was a world-class salesman. Yeah. In fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger got a tax increase passed once on the ballot and also a second time in the form of a recovery bond. Uh, so now Jerry <laughs> Brown has to go out and do something which is not his strength, which is to be a salesman. We're on the peninsula, but we can't help but notice what's going on in a congressional race in the East Bay, which you've been covering. <laughs> yes. um, it's, it's incumbent uh, Stark, Stark raving Pete Stark. Not, not mad men, but mad men. <laughs> yeah, um, and and um, is this just maybe the quintessential example of someone who's stayed too long and been too well entrenched and doesn't understand that maybe the electorate and the, the political environment have changed around him? I think, you know, you may be right there. I mean, Pete Stark is the dean of the California delegation. He's been, you know, 20 terms in, in office. Uh, he's 80 years old. And he, uh, he got that office by, you know, uh, challenging another long-term person saying, look, you're, you're too old, you need, we need fresh ideas. That's exactly what his young challenger, Eric Swalwell, who's an Alameda County Deputy District Attorney, is going with. It has set Stark off in, at being asked questions about his age and whether he's been there too long. Uh, we did it just recently and said, aren't you going to debate? And he said, why? So I could take stupid questions like the ones you're asking me right now. Uh, and he's made a number of gaffes. And in the last week, it was very shocking where Alberto Tarico, the former Democratic leader, um, actually said that Stark threatened him, threatened his job, threatened his kids, threatened to send social workers to his house to check up on their safety after he said he was going to endorse the opponent. Because he was questioning his sanity about doing questioning this. Questioning his sanity, yeah. uh, saying you'll never work in this town again, <laughs> uh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Now, maybe this kind of stuff happens all the time in politics, but the fact is this has happened numerous times to Pete Stark. Uh, the, the gaffes keep on coming. A lot, of, a lot of, you know, labor people say, hey, he's been there a long time, done a lot of great things for them and for progressive causes. But the fact is, you're right. The top two primary, 
And the change in redistricting lines have changed. This is an example of how it's changed California politics already. He never would be challenged by a Republican in that right. very Democratic district. This time, he's, he's facing the challenge of his life. Off-time an, uh, off an incumbent position will retreat to what? Victimhood and you know, it's me against the system and I'm being wronged. Uh, Charlie Rangel played this card yeah. very well in his last election. Um, Pete Stark has become that lowest of political creatures, which is a bully. He bullies reporters at the Chronicle. He bullies his opponents. He will bully his constituents. And to me, that is just political arrogance at its worst. And he, he it, frankly, he frankly should be punished for it. You gotta wonder how other incumbents, longtime incumbents, though, are watching this also, uh, saying, "Wow, if this can happen to him, uh, <laughs> could it happen to me?" Well, is it an example of losing touch? I think you, he's been in for so long, and he has been, this is a constant threat I get back to, there's so little competition in so many political races in California that this is what comes of that system. Yeah, I think that's why this is interesting. The Democrat is the one who's giving him a big challenge. Well, I think all we, I can we see is see. We'll, yeah. we'll commit unequivocally, nobody bullies Carla Marinucci on this show. <laughs> thank you. And that's all we have time for, <laughs> Carla. Bill Whalen, thank you so much for being with us. We'll be back again, and we'll be back again on the game. And I want to start off by reminding people we're going to have a live election night show give you all the coverage. Hopefully Bill and Carla can find their way on. I'm Mark Simon. That's been The Game. Thanks for joining us.